planes are a national obsession. Since the earliest days of flight, Britain has designed and built some of the world's most iconic aircraft. It's a proper, proper British design. During decades of conflict, the planes that Britain built helped build our nation. If it wasn't for the camel, would we have won World War One? I'm not sure. What did the Lancaster do for us as a nation? It led Europe to freedom. These planes made heroes of the pilots who flew them. And you know, this is a place where we, you know, we really should pay respect. And in this series, we'll be revealing how British-built planes revolutionised aerial combat. Having forward-facing machine guns, having the technology, gives you the edge. Plus, we'll meet the people determined to keep these icons of aviation in the air and preserve them for generations to come. This time, the story of the world-famous Spitfire. It's become the plane, really, that stood World War II. The plane that fought the Battle of Britain and helped save the nation from Nazi invasion. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Perhaps the greatest piece of engineering in British history. The Spitfire was a weapon, a beautiful weapon and an iconic one. In my opinion, the, the finest aircraft ever built. And for those that flew her, the perfect flying machine. You didn't so much get into a Spitfire and fly it, you strapped a Spitfire on and you flew with the Spitfire. It's the plane that changed the course of history and still reigns supreme. We all go weak at the knees when we see uh, the Spitfire overhead and you probably want to burst into tears when you see them. It's the summer of 1940, and Britain is fighting for its very survival. The Nazi invaders have steamrolled their way across Europe. With France in German hands, Adolf Hitler prepares for the invasion of the British Isles. Hitler had hoped that Britain would realize that they couldn't win the war, would come to terms. So he therefore laid down a plan called Operation Sea Lion. The plan would involve tens of thousands of troops crossing the Channel to storm the beaches of southern England. But it couldn't proceed until the German Luftwaffe controlled the airspace above their invasion fleet. They were prepared to attack this country, provided they could get air superiority. And so the Battle of Britain was to get air superiority over the RAF. All that stood in Hitler's way was the Royal Air Force, with a brand new aircraft, so far untested in battle. Britain was pretty ill-prepared for war in 1940. The one contingency for which Britain was well-equipped in 1940 was to defend itself against attack, because it had these new fighters, the Spitfire. This new aircraft was about to face the ultimate test, with the fate of a nation hanging in the balance. But the story of Britain's greatest fighter didn't begin in the shadow of war. It began on a summer's day, almost a decade earlier. In 1931, a million people gathered on the south coast to watch the famous Schneider Trophy Race, a competition to find the world's fastest seaplane. Everybody was um, designing new aircraft to compete in these races, and sometimes uh, one nation won them, sometimes the others did. The British took this very seriously. Britain's entry, the Supermarine S6B monoplane, was the work of up-and-coming designer Reginald Mitchell. Mitchell's plane was victorious, reaching speeds of over 400 miles per hour, a world record. Britain's air ministry were quick to take notice. And the chief of the air staff said, I want some new ideas. I want monoplanes instead of biplanes. And he felt that monoplanes should be investigated. 
most aircraft of the era were biplanes. Two wings provided greater lift. But there was a downside. Greater air resistance meant less speed. Monoplanes offered the promise of an aircraft that would be more streamlined and much faster. Mitchell's initial attempt at building a monoplane fighter, the Type 224, turned out to be a flop. His design was let down by an underpowered engine. And Mitchell was actually not angry, but uh, disappointed with this. So he then went back to his drawing board. Mitchell had faith in his monoplane design, now paired with a new Rolls-Royce engine, the Merlin. It was a game changer. In March 1936, Mitchell's Spitfire prototype flew for the very first time. The plane evolved into one of, if not the greatest, high-level interceptor fighter of the Second World War. But as it was being put through its paces, the threat from Nazi Germany was increasing. Hitler was developing new long-range bombers and building the largest air force in Europe. Britain's pre-war Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, had warned that London could quickly be devastated by a fleet of enemy bombers. Stanley Baldwin had uttered the words, the bomber will always get through. And there was a fear, therefore, if war broke out, that the Germans would launch a big bombing campaign against this country. Now more than ever, Britain needed a fighter that could protect its skies. In June 1936, the RAF placed its first order for 310 Spitfires. Tragically, a year later, Reginald Mitchell succumbed to cancer at the age of just 42, but he left a remarkable legacy. His Spitfire was a streamlined fighter with an all aluminium fuselage, enclosed cockpit and retractable landing gear powered by an improved 1,000 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. It was armed with eight 303 caliber Browning machine guns, each capable of firing at a rate of more than 1,000 rounds per minute. And its elliptical wing here gives the Spitfire its distinctive look. The Spitfire would become the most agile aircraft in the sky. The Spitfire was described by those who flew it as a perfect flying machine. So, yes, the engine, yes, the wing shape, yes, the power, yes, the way that it flew. They said you didn't so much get into a Spitfire and fly it, you strapped a Spitfire on and you flew with the Spitfire. A coming together of perfect flying machinery to make what many people regarded at the time as the perfect fighter. And 80 years on, pilots still marvel at Mitchell's design. So behind me, we have a Spitfire. This one is a T9, so she's a trainer version of the iconic single-seat Spitfire. In my opinion, the, the finest aircraft ever built. It's a, a combination of, of an incredible uh, airframe, all-metal construction, a very thin but elliptical wing that produces so much lift the original design was for eight Browning machine guns, and later on they put 20 millimeter cannon and 50 cal heavy machine guns. So it was just a game changer overnight. The simplicity of the controls made the Spitfire a dream to fly. So uh, the right hand to fly the Spitfire. Uh, if I move the stick left and right, the ailerons are moving on the, uh, on the wing tips. If I pull back on the stick, I'm uh, moving the elevator behind. So up and down essentially creating less or, or more lift at the back to make the aircraft climb or descend. With my left hand here I've got the throttle so just like the accelerator on a car idle and full power as I uh, push the uh, throttle forward. Undercarriage is on the right so raise and lower the wheels. I have to swap hands from takeoff to raise the undercarriage uh, and then back obviously flying the Spitfire like so. Fire button on the stick how you would uh, fire the guns safe and then to fire it that enables the button now to be depressed to fire it. The Spitfire was a weapon, a beautiful weapon and an iconic one and, and, a, and a fabulous aircraft to fly, but that was what it was designed for. 
In the summer of 1940, no one knew what the Spitfire was really capable of. The RAF was vastly outnumbered by the German Luftwaffe. A titanic battle for survival that would decide the very fate of Britain was about to begin. In the summer of 1940, Britain seemed on the brink of defeat. Nazi Germany had crushed resistance on the continent of Europe. Now only the RAF and its new wonder weapon, the Spitfire, stood between Hitler and total domination. The battle of Britain is about to begin. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. But if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest out. Britain's on the back foot. The RAF stands alone. The Battle of Britain was about to commence. The outcome would change the course of history and the Spitfire would play a crucial role. In July 1940, the Luftwaffe began their offensive by attacking British ships in the English Channel. The Germans' plan was to draw out the Spitfire squadrons and test them against their most advanced fighter plane, the Messerschmitt 109. It was a formidable opponent. With a key advantage over the Spitfire, this had more powerful weaponry. This is the standard German fighter aircraft during the Battle of Britain and, in fact, during the entire Second World War. This was a machine built to kill. The main guns would have been right there in the wings. And they were machine cannons, which fired a larger bullet. And this bullet has an explosive charge. You can think of them as grenades, automatic grenade launchers. So each gun, there's two of them, would each fire 500 rounds per minute. A devastating firepower. So the armament of the Spitfire threw three Browning machine guns fitted in the wings, the eight-gun fighter as it is known, and that is where the Messerschmitt was a superior aircraft in a lot of regard to the Spitfire. But what the Spitfire lacked in firepower, it made up for in speed and agility. Its elliptical wings slipped easily through the air, lowering the resistance pilots call drag. So the elliptical wing, it essentially tapers towards the wingtip, just reduces the drag. So as you've got the lift go being produced by the, the wing, that reduces as the, as the wing tapers out. And it's a very efficient form of reducing drag whilst you're flying. The handling qualities are perfect and the lift that it produces is amazing. Throughout July 1940, the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt went head to head over the coast of southern England. During the war, I was a young boy living in Portsmouth during the time of the Battle of Britain. And we often saw the dogfights overhead. The elliptical wing of the Spitfire was very distinctive and its movement, I can see it now, actually weaving above. It was almost, to us a game, it wasn't, of course. One of the pilots who flew the Spitfire during World War II was Alan Scott. He credits its agility for helping him outfox the German Messerschmitt. The Messerschmitt could not outturn the Spitfire, but the tighter it could do, we could go tighter. If you could fly the Spitfire properly, you didn't get shot down. But as capable as the Spitfire was, it wasn't fighting the Channel battles alone. It worked in tandem with another iconic British fighter, the Hawker Hurricane. It was almost a combination between the Spitfires and the Hurricanes. The Germans, when they came over, their bombers were protected by fighters above them. And so what the Spitfire basically did was to attack the fighters, whilst allowing the Hurricanes to account for the bombers. The Spitfire dealing with the uh, escort was extremely important. RAF Fighter Command had another key advantage over the Luftwaffe. Their radars could detect the incoming planes. 
Britain had the most sophisticated system of fighter defense in the world with radar and with a telephone system that were able to vector them onto the approaching uh, formations. This was an extraordinary achievement. And so the Luftwaffe, from beginning to end of the Battle of Britain, they could see the Spitfire and the Hurricane, but they could never grasp the sophistication of the radar which was picking up their attacks. Against all the odds, Britain's fighter pilots were holding the German Luftwaffe at bay. But now, the Germans suddenly changed their tactics. They'd taken a hammering from the Spitfires in the air, and so they tried to smash them on the ground. Vulnerable to an Airbus was first highlighted during the Battle of Britain. RAF aircraft were extremely vulnerable, sat on the deck. If they were still there and caught by surprise by the German uh, bombers, they were taken out in quite large numbers. The crunch came on the 18th of August. A huge aerial armada, 300 Nazi bombers and 700 fighters headed for England with orders to pulverize the Spitfire bases. It's gone down in history as the RAF's hardest day. When the squadron bell rang and, you know, everybody was screaming scramble, they would, you know, in amazingly, they would be able to get 12 Spitfires airborne in around about two minutes. Ground engineers would start them, they would strap in as they taxied and they would get airborne. It was the most intense dogfighting yet. Both sides knew that the battle had reached its climax. Try and understand what it must have been like knowing that some of you wouldn't be coming back from that sortie, doing that four or five times a day. I think it's hard to really imagine just, just the bravery that those young lads had. Spitfire pilot Alan Scott was typical of his generation. The risk of death was ever present. Are you frightened? Of course you were. But uh, nature had a wonderful way of uh, taking it away from you. Uh, the, you've heard of the cold sweat. Well, the sweat used to trickle down almost into your mouth as you were doing. The cold sweat is fear, but because you're in the middle of a fight, you, you accept this cold sweat as just normal, and you don't really class it as fear, but that's what it was, actually. Um, yes, you were frightened, there's no doubt about it. In the skies overhead, young Spitfire pilots were losing their lives by the dozen. If you look back, uh, at the Spitfire pilots, they were not experienced aviators. You know, uh, basic flying training. There are stories about pilots who turn up on the squadron, they park their, their little car, and they are sent immediately up because of the way that the battle is going, and they need everybody airborne at that particular moment in time, and they never come home. The RAF lost over 60 aircraft in a single afternoon. But crucially, Britain was still fighting. And Hitler, losing patience, was about to make a catastrophic strategic error. He now decided that the quickest way to bring Britain to its knees would be a series of massive bomber raids on London. The RAF couldn't believe their luck, as pressure on the Spitfire bases was eased at the critical moment. The great principle about everything in the military is make up your mind what your objective is and stick to it. By moving on to attack London, which, as Churchill said, was like some prehistoric animal that could endure an enormous amount of punishment. The direction of the Luftwaffe was crazy. If he'd stuck to attacking the RAF's airfields of Southeast England, he might have been successful. Soon, the RAF was ready to hit back. And on the 15th of September, British radar picked up hundreds of German planes headed for London. It was their biggest attack yet. Once again, Spitfires took to the air to take on the Luftwaffe. The British people had this extraordinary experience, something that never happened before in history, that here, one of the decisive battles of all time was fought over their heads and in their sight. With Britain's future at stake, the RAF began to extend its mastery over the German Luftwaffe. Looking out from their nice gardens, they're watching 
one of the great events of history taking place over their head with um, uh, empty cartridge cases tinkling down in their gardens and sometimes bailed out pilots coming down around them. In a day of intense dogfights, the Spitfires and Hurricanes shot down 56 German planes. It would become known as the Battle of Britain Day, an overwhelming defeat of the Luftwaffe. Within days, Hitler aborted his plans to invade, and by the end of October, the battle was over. Britain owed a debt of gratitude to the RAF's brave pilots. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Churchill was right. If hadn't been for that small band of pilots in a battle of Britain, we would not have survived because the Germans would have dominated the skies and invaded this country. So the sheer bravery and commitment of those pilots is beyond praise. They were, not surprisingly, overwhelmed by the adulation that fell upon them. Because they were fighting this battle among their own people who could see it all happening around them. They were these young men, young handsome men, risking their lives. Plucky little plane against a huge ballast of Nazi Germany. Little plane setting off against the enemy. And at the controls was this handsome young man risking everything. So really, every girl was in love with them, and I think I would have been too. They were glamorous, they were brave, they were strong, and, you know, they were up there fighting for freedom. Victory in the Battle of Britain had also secured the Spitfire's place in history. The Spitfire, of course, got all the attention. In truth, there were far more hurricanes involved in the battle than the Spitfires, but there's no doubt that the Germans had a Spitfire complex in a way that they didn't have about the hurricanes. A Spitfire was an absolutely crucial part of the success of the Battle of Britain. The shape of history would definitely have been very, very, very different if we'd have lost the Battle of Britain. By the end of 1940, British factories were making over 300 Spitfires a month. It was thanks in part to a crowdfunding campaign. What was set up was something called the Spitfire Fund, and it allowed people to donate money to the war effort. Each Spitfire cost around £12,000, the equivalent of £650,000 today. In the spring of 1940, Minister of Air Production, Lord Beaverbrook, asked the public to help pay for them. And so this idea uh, got around that you take the collecting tins round and you say, give some money and we will name the Spitfire for your city or your country. It's fascinating that the Spitfire was actually crowdfunded. And really, I think the government saw this was an absolutely brilliant way of building propaganda and building war funds. Every town wanted one. But not every town could afford one. The public were encouraged to give what they could. From £2,000 for an engine to sixpence for a rivet. There was huge national pride for people in the idea of their Spitfire going up. And, you know, incredibly touching stories such as the miners of Durham who were really suffering from unemployment. They funded two Spitfires. With the help of the public's donations, factories were busy round the clock to satisfy the demand from the RAF. The Spitfire Fund raised about £13 million from donations. £13 million during the war was probably equivalent to £650 million now. It was an astonishing success. The Spitfire had come to represent Britain's bulldog spirit. But soon it would be called upon in a new fight, just as deadly as the Battle of Britain. In 1941, the Spitfire would be called upon to do battle in an entirely new theatre of war. Hitler wanted to conquer North Africa. But forces stationed on the British colony of Malta threatened German supply lines. Before any invasion, the Luftwaffe would have to defeat the RAF. British engineers realised that though the Spitfire had triumphed in the Battle of Britain, 
improvements could still be made. No one said, well, wow, the Spitfire's great, that's all we need, let's stick with that, we're bringing down the Germans super fast. A lot of efforts were made throughout the war to really transform it. During the early months of the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire was outgunned by the cannons of the German Messerschmitt. But later models were more powerful and more heavily armed. An updated Merlin engine provided more speed. The redesigned wings typically carried four machine guns and two 20mm cannons, capable of firing shells with an explosive charge. Finally, the Spitfire was a match for the Messerschmitt. It wasn't until the Mark V that the wings were expanded slightly with teardrops so it could carry the cannons. And of course the rival, the 109, had the two cannons, had the two machine guns. The Merlin engine, you stick that into the Mark V, that unique design, and you have one hell of a fighter. In the nick of time, the first of the new Spitfires reached the beleaguered island in March 1942. Alan Scott was one of the Spitfire aces who took part in the Battle of Malta. Malta was strategically important for both sides, and we have to keep the men open, because without that open, we lost on the Far East. So it was a very important target for the Axis to attack. They wanted to get rid of us. Hitler was determined to bomb Malta into submission. The island was under siege. Just as they were during the Battle of Britain, the Spitfire squadrons were outnumbered. The fighting was very fierce indeed. They were still sending boxes of 100 bombers to flatten the island all the time. And we sometimes only got down to four serviceable Spitfires. I mean, I'm talking about my squadron. There were three squadrons on the Malta. Um, and uh, you had to send four Spitfires up against, uh, say, 100 coming in. And they were always escorted by one on nines. So a dogfight was uh, just inevitable at almost every flight you did. The dogfights often proved deadly. 120 RAF pilots were killed during the siege. It was a tough time and people really didn't realise how tough Malta was compared with, say, the Battle of Britain. Despite the losses, the courageous young pilots of the RAF once again managed to repel the Luftwaffe. And remarkable men like Alan Scott paid tribute to the Spitfire as the key to victory. Spitfire is so manoeuvrable, you could do almost anything in it. And that's why a Spitfire was so useful, because it became part of you. Uh, you, you fitted it like a, an overcoat around you, and if you turned, the aircraft would turn. Within months of the arrival of the Spitfires, the siege of Malta was over. And gradually, the Allies were able to seize back control of North Africa. As new Spitfires rolled off the production lines in Britain, a new crisis developed. Combat pilots couldn't be spared from frontline duties to ferry them from the factories. And so volunteer pilots, many of them women, had to be urgently recruited and trained to fly in what became known as the Air Transport Auxiliary. Eleanor Wadsworth was one of those female ATA pilots. ATA did the job because they, they liked the flying, they liked the, the life, and they felt they were doing something worthwhile for the war effort. Eleanor joined up in 1941. I was looking for something that might be of use. An elderly friend of my mother's suggested that I might get in touch with them, which I did. When Eleanor joined the ATA, women weren't allowed to fly fighters. But as aircraft production ramped up to meet demand, women were finally allowed to fly Spitfires. Eleanor seized the opportunity with both hands. A notice went up on the notice board to say that that's what they were doing. And if you were interested, sign on, which is what I did. 
and told my mother that I was thinking of learning to fly. And she said, well, she said, if they think you're safe to deliver those expensive aircraft, then go ahead. I was based near Leicester, picking up the Spitfires from Castle Bromwich and take them from there to maintenance units where they were gunned up. But back in 1941, the idea of women playing such an active part in the war wasn't universally accepted. There was a lot of resistance to women flying planes, from factory to front line, or even just between air bases. People thought it was unnatural, it was disgraceful, and they thought it was too dangerous. Really, that was a man's job. But the women of the ATA confounded their skeptics. They proved more than capable of getting aircraft to where they were needed. Eleanor learned to overcome one of the toughest challenges for a Spitfire pilot. The long nose of the aircraft makes visibility a major problem. When you were approaching to land, until you got on the ground, you couldn't really, well, you could see the side of the runway, but you couldn't see the middle of the runway. The women absolutely proved themselves. They were fast, they were successful, they were efficient, and the, the Royal Air Force really came to rely on them as absolutely essential to keeping these planes in the sky. Our admiration for the women of the ATA who flew the Spitfire, it really knows no bounds. And Britain's most famous fighter held a special place in Eleanor's heart. When you look at a Spitfire, it's a beautiful design. Aesthetically, it's beautiful. And when you look at them today, they don't look out of date. They're just a beautiful, if you like, a sculpture. The Spitfire wasn't just elegant. It was supremely effective. How can you not say iconic? about the Spitfire, this thing of stupendous beauty. Most weapons of war are not beautiful. The Spitfire is fantastically beautiful aircraft. It also achieved a special status. Not only was it lovely, but it became um, one of the saviors of Britain. Throughout the war, the Spitfire underwent a continuous program of improvement to increase its range, speed and weaponry. It is the only airplane that was made before, during and after World War II. By the closing years of the war, it was 100 miles per hour faster, it could climb faster, so it was actually a much more effective airplane near the end of the war than it had been from the beginning of the war. It was an incredible flying machine. It really couldn't be bettered. They were variants of the Spitfire for very good reason, because the Spitfire was such a solid platform to work on. It played a huge role in turning the tide of the war in the Allies' favour. They were very useful, very successful. They weren't just used in blitz. They weren't just used in bomber campaigns. They were really effectively used throughout the whole of World War II. In May 1945, Germany surrendered. The war in Europe was over. The Spitfire had played a crucial role preventing a Nazi invasion. In total, more than 20,000 were built. In the years after the war, most were sent for scrap. The British had too many Spitfires, but you'd have to be incredibly grateful that we did have the Spitfires for that one job for which they were perfect. But seven decades on, an extraordinary effort is now underway as the son of a wartime Spitfire pilot hopes to put his dad's plane back into the air. Oh wow, that's just fantastic. I can't tell you how excited this makes me. <laughs> it's fantastic. The Spitfire had undoubtedly played a pivotal role in the Allied victory of World War II. But even Britain's most famous fighter couldn't keep up with the unstoppable march of technology. The dawn of the jet age saw the Spitfire become obsolete. It was only the rise of the jet 
that killed the Spitfire forever and made it into a, a relic, a souvenir. But without the rise of the jet plane, the Spitfire would have carried on forever. The last part goes into the last Spitfire. It all started in the life and death days of the Battle of Britain. Now we've got more Spitfires and we know what to do with. The Spitfire was finally retired in the 1950s and most were scrapped. Of the 22,000 produced, today fewer than 300 remain and only around 60 are airworthy. But there are people determined to save the great plane that helped save Great Britain. What's going on then, Tim? Uh, master switch cables, run them down to the fuse box. In Bedfordshire, engineer Tony Hoskins and his colleagues are bringing Spitfires back to life. Spitfire is it's an iconic machine. If you're looking at something that is designed that most people know of as a household name, then Spitfire is going to come up as an aeroplane. And then seeing it get back into the air again, I take great, great pride from that. At the moment, they're restoring a Seafire, a naval version of the Spitfire that was first produced in 1942. The Navy needed a uh, fighter that could defend the fleet. So they came up with a Seafire series, which is an adaptation of the the land-based Spitfire fighter that everyone knows. And uh, in the early part of 1943, they got around to the, the design that we see here, which is the Seafire 15. Whilst Seafires don't survive a lot because of the very nature of the operations they were on, there's three known survivors, of which this is, is one. So it's a really unique aeroplane. Even more unusually, it's now owned by the son of one of its original pilots. Tim Percy's dad, Captain Terence Percy, flew the Seafire when he served with the Royal Navy. He was flying that aircraft um, from HMS Venerable in 1946. HMS Venerable was doing a tour of the Far East. Uh, she was stationed initially in um, Sri Lanka. He always told me that that was the favorite aircraft he ever flew. Amazingly, 70 years later, Tim managed to track down his dad's Seafire. I was looking at a website which detailed all the remaining airframes of, of uh, all birds from that era. And I suddenly came across this small section of Seafires. Couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, I, I literally saw spots in front of my eyes. Tony's been working on the Seafire since it arrived in 2014. Jobs like this can cost upwards of two million pounds and can take a decade to complete. It was all together and intact, but it was an empty shell. And there's so much to do to take it apart and check. And really that's been the whole process, stripping it back and uh, making sure that everything is correct and not damaged and is serviceable for another 50, 60, 70 years. The team keep things on track by using the Supermarine's original designs. We've got all the relevant drawings up here for wiring, for plumbing, for cable runs, for uh, both electrical and control cable. All the current items that are in work, we've got the relevant information up here pulled from the manuals. The designs might help, but as the last Spitfire was produced in 1946, sourcing parts is a challenge. There is a network of collectors and enthusiasts. You can still find items today that have never been fitted in service, that have been sat in collections or stores or people's homes and sheds. But sometimes it is just luck. Tim's come along today to see how Tony's getting on. Hey, Tony, good to see you. Good to see you. Who are you? I'm all right. All right. Really excited to show you some stuff. I, I can't wait. Right, so here we go, Tim. Oh, wow. That's just fantastic. That's got, huge progress. We've got some more bits yeah. on, and uh, yeah, they've been painted. And we're fitting out all the items on here. Some of it's yeah. gone away, yeah. some of it's already tagged and serviceable, so ready to okay. go back on. Now we're starting to make some real progress. Is that? I can't tell you how excited this makes me. <laughs> it's fantastic. A lot of this has been ripped out. There's, there's still some stuff that's original. So uh, the um, slow running cutout that's there, mm -hmm. that's the original. So that's yep. the one that your dad used when right. he was in yeah, this yeah. aeroplane. Yeah. Everything we could reuse has gone back in. But today's big news is the arrival of the spars, the skeleton of the Seafire's wings. 
They're beautiful. That's really fantastic. Oh, I, I, now the progress is there. Yeah. Oh, that's that's really something. And we're just now we're taking your original parts of the wings that we've had in store for a while, setting them onto the back. So all of these feet have been going onto the back of the spine. We've been mm -hmm. putting those in. And we're going to bring this portion of the wing in as well. Mm -hmm. Set up all the points, and then we start each rib at a time and work our way through. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, there's so much of the original aircraft there. That's what's so fantastic. It's slow but steady progress. Tim's ambition is to be able to take to the air in his father's Seafire. Sadly, Tim's dad died before work on the plane started, but it's made Tim even more determined to see her fly. I think everybody knows who knows <laughs> what an extraordinary aircraft the Spitfire is. It is the most beautiful plane that was ever built. To be associated with something that my father flew, I think it's an extraordinary thing. They're all special. They have their own characters. And this one's character is the fact that it's owned by the son of the man who flew it. Really look forward to the day when it sat on the flight line there, and we've all had our photograph taken in front of it, having spent you know, probably the best part of a decade rebuilding it. I take great, great pride in that. I know that he's there behind the clouds somewhere, looking down and smiling on the whole thing. Although few of us will ever get the chance to restore a Spitfire, there are still opportunities to admire this iconic aircraft in flight. No, no air display now is really possible without a Spitfire. When a Spitfire flies past, people look to the skies. There is something magical about this aircraft. It, it stirs up an emotion in, in people that is, uh, that is lovely to see. It remains a marvel of engineering and the legacy of a remarkable man. Reginald Mitchell. The Spitfire really is an icon of British engineering. We all um, have a tear in our eye when we see the Spitfire overhead. The Spitfire puts its stamp on British history like no other machine before or since. British engineers may well say it represents their finest hour. What you can say is what the veterans themselves would say. They talk about an almost perfect fighter. I flew it uh, when I was uh, 96 and did some steep turns, did a roll, and just to make sure that I could still fly it. It's like riding a bicycle. It's a wonderful aircraft. The Spitfire always will be our most beloved plane. The Spitfire is a fine example of what we can do, what we are capable of as a nation.